Well, good morning, Redeemer Bible Church. Wonderful to be here. You know, the last time I was here, there were a lot of goats. Uh, and of course, I mean that literally. There were a lot of goats over in this field over here eating all the grass. So Community Bible Church, uh, where I hail from, will be happy to know that there are no more goats at Redeemer Bible Church, just sheep. And uh, that's a good thing. So uh, if you have your Bibles, you could open up to Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll be looking at uh, the prayer that Paul prays at the end of Ephesians chapter 3, one of my favorite passages in Scripture. You know, for better or worse, Ikea has uh, revolutionized home furnishings. And I'm not talking about the fact that you can buy meatballs along with your furniture, as great as that is. No, but before Ikea, if you wanted to build furniture, I mean, you would just never think of doing it yourself. I mean, at least I wouldn't. Maybe some of you are handy that way, but I'm not. And so you never thought that you could build you know, a cupboard or, you know, a bookshelf or a couch or a bed frame or anything like that. But Ikea came along and they sort of changed the whole process by designing all of their furniture around that Allen wrench. That's that little L-shaped thing that you get in just about every piece of Ikea furniture. Now, if you try to build that furniture without the Allen wrench, you're going to find that very frustrating and nearly impossible. Maybe even with the Allen wrench, you'll find it frustrating and nearly impossible. But with that Allen wrench, you can do things that you never thought were possible. You could build a bookshelf. You could build a bed frame. You can build an entertainment center. Things that you never thought you could do, you can do now because of that little wrench. Well, I think the Christian life is a little bit like that. You know, the power of God in your life, you can do things that you never thought you could do. Now, if you try to live the Christian life without the power of God, it's going to be like trying to build the Ikea furniture without that little wrench. And you'll find it frustrating and nearly impossible. And I bet we've all had that experience, right? Trying to live the Christian life in our own strength without the power of God. But with the power of God you can actually do things that you never thought were possible. Sin can be overcome. You don't have to be enslaved to the things that you were before. You can boldly proclaim the gospel when you used to be characterized by fear and unwillingness to open your mouth to family or friends or coworkers that don't know the gospel. You can love people that are actually really hard to love. Not in your own strength, but because of the power of of God. Now, when we think about the power of God, a lot of times we think about it in creation, right? That that God can create everything out of nothing, and that is power on full display. Or we think about God's power in salvation, that he can take someone that didn't want anything to do with Christ and then change their heart so they love Christ. But that same power that can create everything out of nothing, that same power that can take someone who hates Christ and turn them into someone who loves Christ, is available to you today so that you can grow in Christ and become more like him. That's what this passage is all about, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And so before we read this text and pray, I want you to think about your life. And I want to think you to think about maybe just one area of your life where you really want to see God's power work. Maybe it's a particularly stubborn sin that you've just been dealing with over and over again, and you finally want to see God give you victory over that. Maybe you've been anxious. I mean, think about the last two years. There's all kinds of fears and anxieties that we've suffered through and with. Maybe you want to see God work in that area so that you're not fearful anymore. Or maybe you want to be more bold in your witness for Christ, that you still feel timid when you're around people that you know don't know Christ. And so just take even a minute. I'll give you about 30 seconds right now. Think about one area of your life. If you're taking notes, you could even jot that down. What's an area of your life where you want to see God work? So take a few moments to think about that, and then we'll read this passage and pray.
So as you think about that, this text is about how God can grow you in that area. It's actually saying that God can do even more than you ask or even think in whatever area it is that you want to grow to become more like Christ. So let's read this passage and pray. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, we don't need to hear my voice. We need to hear your voice. And you speak through your word. And we're thankful for that because you know exactly what we need to hear. Sometimes words of encouragement, sometimes words of challenge and conviction. But as we look at this text, I pray that you'd encourage us with the reminder that your power is available to us every single day so that we can live a life that pleases you and glorifies you. Lord, you want us to look like Christ, both individually but also corporately as a body, as this church. You want us to be a great representation of Christ on this earth. And when we pray according to that end, it says that you will do far more abundantly than we ask or even think. So Lord, may we call out to you for this kind of power in our lives so that you would be glorified, so that your church would be an accurate reflection of Christ and that many would see Christ through us. So Lord, do your work this morning, through your word, in Christ's name, amen. Now, so the title of this message is Call Out to God for His Power. So first, call out to God for His power so that you can experience Christ. Look at verses 14 to 17. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if you want to experience God's power in your life, like Paul, you need to humbly acknowledge your desperate need for God's power. Right? How does Paul start this? I bow my knees. I mean, he's not just saying like, hey, I'm going to pray for you. He's like, no, I'm going to get on my knees, on my face, before the Lord. Why does he do that? Because he's acknowledging that he can't do for the Ephesians what they need. Only God can do that. So he's desperate for God to work in their lives. And he knows that God is the great provider of all that they need. And God is the powerful one that can bring his power into their life. So humbly acknowledge your need for God's power. Now, he starts this in verse 14 by saying, for this reason. Uh, So for what reason? You sort of have to track back. What is he talking about as he gets into this prayer? Well, in many ways, he's reflecting back over the first two chapters of Ephesians. That's what leads into this prayer that he prays. So what does he talk about in Ephesians 1? Well, it talks about that God chose you before the foundation of the world, that he planned your adoption through the blood of his son. So for this reason, I pray this prayer. How about chapter 2? Chapter 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. For this reason, pray this prayer. And really, the immediate thought right before this prayer is in chapter 2, verse 22. 
he says, in him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God has saved you. God has adopted you. God's put you into a body where he wants to dwell and be on display to the world. For this reason, I pray this prayer. And so bow your knees before him because of the work that he's already done in bringing you into this family and wanting to display himself through you. But also bow your knees before him because of who he is. Back in verse 15, chapter 3, how does he describe the father? He's the one from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. What does that mean? Well, it means he is the creator of everything. Every family, right? In heaven and on earth, everything was created by him. And it says he's named everything. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he just chose your name, that you're going to be Sam, you'll be Maggie, you'll be Andrew. No, that's not what he's talking about. It means that he has charted out the course of your entire existence. He's sovereign. He's in charge. He's planned out the course of your life. And so for this reason, also, bow your knees before him. You want to live a life that honors him. And then what do you do? As you bow your knees before him, as you acknowledge who he is, your desperate need of him, then in verse 16, you ask for the power that comes from him alone. Verse 16, here is really the heart of the request that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. All right, what do you need? What do you need in this prayer? You need strength. You don't have whatever Paul's praying for, you don't have it on your own. And so you need to ask God for it. You need to ask God to strengthen you. What is he going to strengthen you with? power through his spirit. What is it that you need? You need power from God so that you'll be strong enough to do what he's about to describe. Now, what kind of power does God have to give to you? We'll look back at chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 18. This is another prayer of Paul's in this letter. Verse 18 says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and here it is, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the power that's available to you to live for him. The power that raised Christ from the dead. The power that put Christ over all things, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The power that put everything else under Christ's feet. That power is available to you. Right? Verse 19, it says, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. This is what you, you need this kind of power from God. And thankfully, verse 16, back in chapter 3, it comes to you according to the riches of his glory. In other words, he has ample power to give. And he wants to be glorified through giving you power to live for him. In verse 16, where does this power come from, or how does it come to us? It says that it comes through the Spirit. 
right? The Spirit is going to bring that power into your life. You can think about Ephesians chapter 5, right? That you're going to be filled with the Spirit, and all of these things are going to happen. And where is this power going to be on display at the end of verse 16? In the inner being, right? Not the outer being. These aren't PEDs, right? These aren't going to make you look like Barry Bonds or something like that. No, God's going to use this power on the inside, the true you, the you that wants to glorify Christ, the you that doesn't want to give in to sin, the you that wants to love other people the way that Christ has loved you. That power is going to be on display there in your inner being. And so acknowledge your need for God's power. Ask for God's power. And then as we look at verse 17, anticipate that God's power is going to come through Christ working in your life. Verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In many ways, this phrase in verse 17 is a parallel to what he just said in verse 16. Right, that you'd be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner person. In other words, that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith. So Christ is going to dwell in your heart. He's going to continue his residence in your heart. Now, of course, he's already started his residence in your heart. But this is the process where he's going to make your heart look like him. Now, you can kind of think of it this way. If you move into a new house or you get a new apartment, right, you sign all the papers, you get the keys, you finally move in. I mean, when you first move into that apartment or that house, I mean, you might just have ramen in the cupboards and a mattress on the floor. You know, it's your house, right? You sign the papers, you have the keys, but that house doesn't look like you, right? Because you haven't done anything yet. You haven't decorated. So over the course of the next several months, you start to decorate that house and make it look like yours. Maybe you go to Ikea, you get some furniture, you put it together, you get it all set up, you put your Justin Bieber poster on the wall, and whatever it is you're into, that house then begins to look like you. Well, it's the same with Christ. When you come to Christ, you are radically changed. You're not your own anymore. You belong to Christ. But there are many things in your heart that don't look like him. He owns you, but you don't yet reflect Christ. There's some changes that need to be made, right? The Justin Bieber poster has got to come down. I mean, maybe the John Piper poster or something like that goes up. Charles Spurgeon, whatever, your favorite preacher. But Christ is going to start to rearrange your heart so that it looks more and more like him and less and less like how you used to be. That's what Christ does. He does this work in your heart. He does it on the inside, right? He doesn't do it on the outside only. You know, sometimes you get a new house, you might just want to put a paint job on the outside and all these things, change the outside. No, 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 Christ wants to change you from the inside. Not just stop doing this, start doing this, but really he begins to get at your motives. Why do you do the things that you do? Why are you not doing this? Why do you think like this? That's the work that Christ begins to do in your heart. And have you ever noticed that Christ often does this work by putting you in the exact same situation over and over again until you start asking the motive questions and not just the external questions? I mean, think about your first job. How does everyone usually end their first job? Usually they quit, right? No one likes working for the first time. I worked for Honey Baked Ham one day, uh, and then I quit. That was my first job. And what's the problem when you quit that first job? What's the boss? I mean, the boss is demanding, uh, my coworkers, I, you know, they're just hard to work with, all these things, and you end up quitting your first job. So then what happens? You get another job. And what happens after that? Well, you get another bad boss. Man, or my coworkers, yeah, they're still just kind of difficult to work with. And so what do you do? Maybe you quit that job. You get another job. Then what happens? It's like, man, another bad boss. But then, hopefully, through the p- course of this process, you begin to think, Maybe the boss isn't the problem. Maybe my coworkers aren't the problem. Maybe my problem's here. Maybe I just don't like being told what to do, so I'm not going to like any job where someone tells me what to do. Or maybe I don't like dealing with people that are difficult to love. And so Christ begins to change your heart. Why do I have such a hard time whenever I get a new job? 
and he starts to change your heart, not just the outside, not your circumstances. He changes you on the inside. How does he do that in verse 17? He does it through faith. This is how Christ makes your heart into his home. He does it through faith. As you trust him more, as you depend on him more, he dwells more fully in your heart. You know, if you think about your house, you might have rooms that you would love someone to come in and just totally remodel that room, right? You know, it's just, it's a mess. I would love for, like, one of those extreme makeover shows to just come in and totally change this room. And so there's areas of your life where you probably want Christ to come in. Come in, change this area of my life. I don't want to be like this anymore. Come right in. But there might be other rooms in your house where it's like you don't even want anyone to look in that room. It's just too embarrassing, or you want it too much. And there's areas of our life that are like that. Or we don't necessarily want Christ to come in and change certain areas of our life. Maybe I like a certain sin that I indulge in, and I don't really want Christ to change me. But as you trust him through faith, as you trust him more and more with every area of your life, you'll see that he'll dwell even in those areas, and he'll change those areas from the inside out. And so as God gives you his power, you'll start to experience the shepherding work of Christ in your heart. And so think of that area where you want God to work again. I mean, what sin seems impossible to overcome? Or what fruit of the Spirit just seems impossible to cultivate? Well, ask God for his power, and he can change even those areas of your life. Do you want to experience Christ's shepherding work in your heart in that area of your life? Then call out to God for his power, and Christ will begin to dwell in your heart through faith. Do you want to start seeing your heart look like Christ's heart? Then ask God for his power, and he'll do that. And pay attention in the weeks and months ahead. You'll start to notice maybe you'll be put in that same situation over and over again. And you're thinking, yeah, this person is so hard to deal with, so hard to love. Or why am I in this situation again? Why can't I just get out of it? But Christ may be putting you in that exact situation so that he can begin to change you and your heart. And so call out to God for his power so that you can experience Christ's work in your life. Now, secondly, call out to God for his power so that he can astound you with Christ's love. Look back at verse 17. So you're praying for God's power to strengthen you, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith with the result that what happens? That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend With all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. This passage is really all about the love of Christ. He says you've been rooted and established already, right? Your relationship with Christ started in his love. He planted you in his love. The foundation of your life is his love. But this prayer is that God would give you power to understand the love of Christ. You're not able to understand the love of Christ apart from God's power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that created everything out of nothing, The same power that changed you from being a hater of Christ to a lover of Christ, that power is necessary for you to understand the love of Christ. I mean, is that not an amazing thought? You need the power of God to understand the love of Christ. Even after you're saved, you still need the power of God to understand the love of Christ. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. You need the power of God to understand the love of Christ. I mean, it's like 
Paul has just spent two chapters really just giving a portrait of the love of Christ. And then he prays this prayer, you don't get this. I don't get this. Nobody gets this. Because it's so immense, it's so incredible, we need the power of God to even minimally understand what I just said. Of everything that he's done for you in Christ. You need that power to understand his love. Why? Well, I think there's two aspects here that Paul highlights. One is just the magnitude of Christ's love. Right? He says the height, the depth, the length, the breadth. Right? This involves all the facets and degrees and expressions of his love. You need God's power because it's so big. And you deepen in your understanding of the magnitude of his love as you begin to see more and more the depths of your own sinfulness. I think when God saves us, we understand we're sinners, right? We need salvation. We've done things that don't please him. But in many ways, I think our view of sin gets even bigger as we're Christians. When we know that Christ forgave me for all of these things and yet I still sin, And hopefully, as you're convicted by that, God is just showing you that his love was even bigger than I imagined. His love was more than just forgiving me in the past. His love was that he's going to keep forgiving me every single day when I sin against him, even knowing what I know about who he is. Or you think about God's holiness. Again, when you got saved, you probably had a big picture of God's holiness. But as you grow as a Christian, that view of God's holiness gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that gap between where you are and where he is just seems to get bigger and bigger. And yet it's the love of Christ that fills that gap. And so the love of Christ gets bigger and bigger in your mind. Or you think about the humility of Christ, that he became a man and died in your place. And the love of Christ just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Or how selflessly Christ serves you. And how he shepherds you throughout the course of your life. And again, his love is even bigger and bigger and bigger than you ever thought. Christ continues to stretch your mind so that you can see just how majestic his love is. That's kind of what this prayer is like, right? We have this understanding of Christ's love. And Paul's basically saying, ask God to stretch your mind so that you can understand more of how big the love of Christ is. Right? Don't be satisfied with the little Dixie cup of God's love, of Christ's love. No, ask God to give you like the big gulp, right? The 64 ounce, you know, the biggest one you can get. It's been outlawed in New York City. No, just ask for a bigger and bigger mind so that you can understand just how big the love of Christ is. And as you pray that prayer, the amazing thing is you can pray this, sing, this prayer every single day. God can answer it every single day. And you'll never get to the end of Christ's love. His love will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as much as you can understand it. So there's a magnitude to the love of Christ, the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, all of those things. But there's also an experience of Christ's love that he talks about in verse 19. He says that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, which is kind of a funny statement, right? How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? Like, so do we know Christ's love or do we not know Christ's love? Yes, right? It's both. We do know Christ's love. We've experienced it. And yet there's a sense in which we still don't know it because we haven't experienced all that there is to experience. You'll never reach the end of Christ's love, not just because of how big it is, but also because you're going to experience it every single day for the rest of your life. I mean, think about this. If you're married, right? Do you know your spouse? Yes. Do you know your spouse in the same way you did when you first got married? I hope not, right? I hope you know and love your spouse way more now than you did the day that you got married because you've seen them love you for Time, in times that you didn't deserve it. Or you've seen them raise your children and love your family. And your experience and your love for your spouse has just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger 
every day that you've lived together. Hopefully, that's your experience. I remember one time that my wife and I went to a wedding, and the best man toast was, I hope today is the day that you love each other the least. And it kind of sounds funny when you first hear it, but as you think about it, you're saying that I hope that your love for each other only gets deeper and deeper and deeper every single day that you're married so that you can actually look back on your wedding day and say, that's the day that we loved each other the least. You know, in many ways, I hope that's how it is for us as Christians, that the day we got saved was actually the day that we loved Christ the least. And that over the course of our lives, as we've seen his love get bigger and bigger and bigger, as he's carried us through life's most difficult trials, as he's given us victory over sin in our life, I pray that we love him more now than we ever did before. And that we can actually look back on the day that we got saved and think that was the day that I loved Christ the least. I love him so much more now because I've seen his love so much more in my life. You know Christ's love now, but you're going to know it so much more throughout the course of the rest of your life. Again, this is a prayer you can pray today and every single day for the rest of your life, and you'll never get to the end of Christ's love. It'll just get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. He's going to keep guarding you from the temptations that you face. He's going to keep providing for you to make sure that those bills get paid. He's going to keep sustaining you through life's trials to love those that are difficult to love or to be with you when, you're, when you lose someone that you love. If you call out to God for his power, you can experience Christ's love like this every single day for the rest of your life. God wants to use his power to astound you with the love of Christ. So call out to God for his power Pray for his power in your life that you can continue to experience the love of Christ in this way. If you feel dry, if his love feels stale, then bow your knees before the Father and ask him for power to understand again the love of Christ. And he will delight to show it to you. Or if you don't yet know Christ's love, If you've never experienced a love that doesn't grow old, that doesn't get stale, that only gets bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper, then come to Christ today. He will forgive your sins. And as amazing as that is, and amazing as that experience will be today, you're only going to deepen in your love for Christ the rest of your life. You'll never be disappointed. You'll never get to a day when you look back and you're like, wow, I really, Christ loved me then, but now, no. It's like, no, he's only going to keep loving you every single day. Come to Christ today. So call out to to God for his power so that he can astound you with the love of Christ. And then at the end of verse 19, call out to God for his power so that you can live like Christ. The end of verse 19, you're praying this prayer. Christ is dwelling in your hearts. He's expanding your mind to understand his love And what's the end result at the end of 19? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So as you're understanding Christ's love, what's happening? Your life is beginning to change. You're seeing aspects of his love that begin to change you. Right? You're frustrated with your kids again. I can't believe they're doing this. They're so annoying. And why can't they just give me five minutes? Whatever. And what, is, what do you get reminded of? How patient is Christ with you when you're not easy to love, when you're just doing what you want to do? How patient is he with you? And you start to see his love. And his love begins to change how you love. You want to be patient like him. How kind is Christ to you when you sin against him? How forgiving is he to you when you wrong him? And as you start to see those things, you begin to change. I can't appreciate these things about Christ and then go keep living the way that I want to live. No, I want to live like him. Help me to live like him. The end of this prayer is that you are filled with the fullness of God. What does that mean? 
Well, filled means that you begin to be characterized by something else, right? Think about Ephesians 5.18 again, this idea of the Spirit, that you're filled with the Spirit. When Paul says that, what does he mean? Does he mean that you don't have the Spirit and you need to be filled with the Spirit, like you're getting something that you don't have? No, we have the Spirit already. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5? It means that your life begins to be characterized by the Spirit. So here he says that you would be filled with something. Not that you get something that you didn't have, but that something else is going to start to characterize your life. What is the amazing thing that he says at the end of verse 19 that is going to start to characterize your life? The fullness of God. The things that make God God are going to start to characterize you. His patience, his love, his grace, his mercy. These aren't just wonderful things that we appreciate about God. These are things that begin to change and characterize you so that you look like the fullness of God. What does the fullness of God look like? Well, I think it looks a lot like Ephesians 4 through 6. Right? Ephesians 4, 1, that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Ephesians 4, 17, you no longer walk like you used to. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, that you become imitators of God and walk in love. Chapter 6, right? Husbands, wives at the end of chapter 5, parents, children at the beginning of chapter 6, that all of your relationships start to get changed. You don't live like you used to live anymore. You live more and more like Christ. But notice, he doesn't give any of those commands in chapters 4 through 6 until he prays this prayer. Ephesians 1 to 3 has one command. Remember who you were. That's in chapter 2, verse 11. Remember who you were. That's the only command in the first three chapters of Ephesians. How many commands do you think there are in chapters 4 through 6 of Ephesians? There are 40 commands. 40 things that you have to do, but none of those come until he prays this prayer. If you try to do Ephesians 4 through 6 without praying this prayer, if you try to do all those things without the power of God, it's not going to work. You're going to find yourself frustrated, right? Trying to build the Ikea furniture without the little wrench. But if you ask God for his power, then Ephesians 4 through 6 becomes possible for you. And you can actually do the things that he's calling you to do in the rest of this letter. But nothing will change apart from God empowering you through his spirit to experience the love of Christ. And so pray this prayer before you go out and try to live for Christ. Make sure you're praying these kinds of prayers. Lord, fill me with power in my inner being. Show me again the love of Christ. And as you do that, then you can live out Ephesians 4 through 6. So what do you want to change? How do you want your life to reflect the fullness of God? Do you want joy even when life hasn't panned out the way that you wanted it to? Do you want to see those stubborn sins overcome? Do you want to overcome anger and love your spouse the way that Christ loves you? Do you want to boldly proclaim Christ even though coworkers or classmates make fun of you? Then ask God for his power. And he'll begin to change your heart to look more like Christ. I mean, what a savior we have. That, how does he want us to change, right? He doesn't say, well, I saved you, now you're on your own, and you better do it, or I'm going to be mad at you. It's like, no, that's not the savior we have. He's like, I saved you, and I want you to live for me. I want you to look like me. But you know what? I'm, you can't do it. So I'm going to give you everything you need so that you can do it. I'm not going to come at you with a whip. I'm going to come at you asking you to pray. I'm asking you to just to call on me to give you power. What do you need that power for? I'm going to give you power so that you can understand how much Christ loves you. And that's what's going to be what changes you. I mean, this is the Christian life. The Christian life on the power of God. An never-ending experience of the love of Christ in a way that changes you to become more like him. That's the Christian life. And what a savior we have. What a God we serve. That he does it this way. Now why does he do it this way? 
because he gets all the glory. That's how this prayer ends. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The reason you pray this prayer so that Christ would be glorified in you and through Christ. Right? It says that he is able to do far more abundantly. Right? He is able. He has the power. Power for what? To do far more abundantly. Right? Limitless power. Whatever you're asking for, he can do it. And he says that you can, he can do more than you ask. And he can do more than you even think. Right? Why does Paul say it that way? Well, I think we always think about things that we never would even ask for. Right? Let's say you've got this bill. It's $100, and you're, you don't have $100. So what do you do? You ask God, God, would you give me $100 so I could pay this bill? But what do you think? Like, Well, I think that God could give me a million dollars, in my mailbox tomorrow, and it could just come out of nowhere, right? But you don't ask for that. You want to be humble, you know, just let me ask for what I need and that God would provide. What does Paul say about how much God can do? He does more than you ask, the hundred dollars. He does more than you could even think. He's going to, he could do more than the million dollars, right? The biggest thoughts you have about what God could do in your life, things you wouldn't even dream of to ask for, but things that you just think about, God can do abundantly more than even those things. So it should go without saying, ask God for some stuff in your life, right? Ask him to change you. Because he's going to do more than you ask. He's even going to do more than you think. This is a blank check from God. What, how do you want your life to reflect the fullness of God? Blank check from God to you. Fill it in. What do you want to see God do in your life so that he gets glory? And Paul says he can do far more abundantly than whatever you write on that check, whatever you're thinking about as you write on that check. God can do far more abundantly than all those things so that he would be glorified and that Christ would be glorified through your life. So pray. Pray these kinds of prayers. Right? When, you hear, when he says that in verse 20, he's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. What's the context of that prayer? Right? That prayer is not about, you know, God, give me a big house, give me a big car, give me whatever I want, and he can do far more abundantly. No, 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 no. Right? The context of this prayer is, if you want power from God so that Christ dwells in your heart, so that you understand the love of Christ and you begin to change, you fill in the blank and God will do far more abundantly than you ask or think. If you want your life to reflect Christ, if you want, even you could think about this corporately as well, if you want your church to reflect Christ, ask God and he'll do far more abundantly than you could ask or even think. He wants to receive glory, right? It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to that power at work within us, right? That's what that power is coming to us to do. It comes in verse 21, to give him glory. Glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. God wants to answer these prayers so that he receives glory. Right? He's seen as glorious. He's seen, the one, he's seen as the one who can change people. So they're no longer characterized by sin, anxiety, unforgiveness. And they're characterized by the love of Christ. He wants to do this to be glorified through the church, through people, and also through his son, the one who changes people, the one whose love totally changes them. He wants to be glorified in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what are the changes that you want to see in your life? What was that thing you wrote down at the beginning of the sermon? You can ask God for that. Even think beyond that. And if you start asking God for those things, asking God, let Christ dwell in my heart. Let me see and understand his love. 
he'll begin to change you in whatever area you wrote down, even beyond what you would even think to write down, also that he gets the glory. That should be the experience of the Christian life. Christ dwelling in your heart, being astounded by his love so that you change to become like him. And so before we close together in prayer, I just want to give you a moment to pray this very prayer to God. Thinking about whatever area of your life you thought about at the beginning, whatever you wrote down on your notes, ask God, according to this prayer, to do this work to give you power to understand the love of Christ, and that love of Christ would begin to change that area. So take a minute or two to pray silently to yourself, and then I'll close us in a minute. Lord, this is an amazing prayer. And forgive us that we don't pray this every day. Lord, this can be our experience every day, but we are just so quick to just jump out of bed and go through each day just in our own strength, relying on ourselves, not relying on you. And even though we stumble and fall and run back to all the things that we maybe have gone to before, we don't often think that this power is, is available to us the kind of power that raised Christ from the dead, that put him far above everything else, that put everything under his feet, the same power that creates everything out of nothing and can change a sinner's heart to love you, that same power is available to us every single day. And the amazing thing is you want to give this power every single day so that we would be amazed every day at the love of Christ and that we'd live every day in the love of Christ. And when we do that, you do change us. There's, I'm sure, many times when we can look back and we can think, how was I able to do that? And we can go back to your power and your power reminding us of the great love that Christ had for us that enabled us to continue to love and live like him. So Lord, I pray for each one of us, whatever area of our life that came to mind as we thought about the truths of this text, that you would change us that you would give us power to understand the love of Christ and you'd begin to change those areas of our life, that you'd help us to overcome sin, that you would help us to love those that are difficult to love, that you'd help us to proclaim Christ even in a hostile environment. And Lord, may we see you do far more abundantly than we ask or think. We pray this prayer also for the church as a whole, this our, the whole church here. We pray that you would astound this church with the love of Christ, and may that change this church to be even a greater witness for Christ among its neighbors and community. Lord, it's amazing that we can call out to you, we can pray these prayers, and that you love to answer them. Help us to pray these things every day, 
to not try to live in our own strength, but to live in your power, seeing the love of Christ fill and fill our hearts every single day. We're so thankful to you, thankful that you would save us, thankful that you would grow us all in the love of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.